Good afternoon. Welcome so to this welcome. session. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with a very great panel here. You know, we have Haitham from IG, Hello. Yusuf from uh, Dubai Economy and Tourism. We have uh, Alka from RAC TDA and Sardan from Zuda Development Company in, in Saudi. So I think it's a very interesting mix. We have the government, we have the operator, we have the developer, and myself, the consultant. So I'll be asking the questions, you know, like any great consultant. It's quite an interesting topic, and we'll look at it from two angles, because we're talking about who should pay for the sustainability measures. So one side is in terms of the destination and the uh, developments, who should pay for the sustainability measures in those destinations, and the second, topic is talking about who pays in terms of the tourist, which kind of tourist wants to pay extra if it's needed, is, and that's another question. Does a tourist have to pay extra to go to a sustainable destination and not leave a footprint behind? So we have a few interesting topics to discuss today. Just as a very quick introduction to the topic, we have, um, from our side, we looked at four different uh, approaches to uh, who pays for the sustainability measures, right? The first one is the polluter pays principle. So whoever is the one contributing to the pollution is the one who should pay for the additional measures to stop polluting, right? And of course, that could create some disbalance between SMEs, governments, disproportionate um, weight on certain companies and might not be necessarily realistic, or, or maybe it is. That's something we'll discuss. Then there is the CSR route, that everyone contributes towards CSR initiatives. But again, that could lead to greenwashing and difficult to monitor what are the real initiatives and what are the uh, more visual uh, initiatives. The other one is uh, looking at taxation-based uh, destination as well. But that, again, could deter tourism from growing in, in a particular destination. And then the last one being joint responsibility of all the different players contributing their part. But again, here, if we're talking about all the different parties contributing, there's a lot of governance challenges that come into play. Who pays for what? How do we control? Is it mandatory? Is it voluntary? So I think these are some of the topics that we're going to discuss. Um, I want to start maybe next to me, Sardan, from Al Suda. And maybe before you answer the question, just give a quick introduction to uh, yourself and Al-Suda and what you're doing at the moment. Um, I want to understand from your point of view, what principle do you believe in, in terms of who should pay for the sustainability measures in a destination? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be at this panel. It's a pleasure to be in this distinguished company. And it's a pleasure to uh, give you more information about what we do. Suda Development Company is a wholly owned uh, company that belongs to the PIF, the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia. It has a budget of around five billion U.S. dollars to deliver a development program of hospitality and primary and secondary infrastructure in one of the most interesting parts of Saudi. We're located in the south of the kingdom, uh, and our site is located at 3,050 meters above sea level, occupying the highest point of Saudi. 85% of Saudi forests are located in our region. And compared to other large Saudi projects, we are considered to be very, very small. But what's really important is that we are blessed with nature, ecosystems that are relatively preserved, and a lot of tangible and intangible heritage when we speak about sustainability in general. When it comes to what I do, I deal with uh, heritage, social aspects, both intangible and tangible, and with environmental aspects concerning nature conservation, also environmental management. But that's not that important. What's more important is the principle that I believe in. And I, being a panelist, I'd like to use the opportunity to say, you know, there's a principle that I don't believe in. And it should be illustrative of how I feel about panels like this or these discussions. I really, truly believe that the end conclusion of this panel should not be that everybody pays for everything and that everybody should chip in for everything, because if everybody should pay for everything, then nobody will pay for anything at the end of the day. We have seen in our professional lives, or I should say in my professional life, I have seen um, ideas and initiatives where we, you, you know, we gather around and we say the government is important, the private sector is important, the NGOs are important, the communities are, everybody is important. Does that mean that everybody should pay? This is just a flavor of how I feel that we should be very 
you know, surgical in terms of deciding the responsibilities and the financial outcomes of these responsibilities when it comes to development and delivery of, of destinations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sardan. And uh, obviously, that's the, that's the insights from a developer's point of view. I want to move a bit, Alka, to a government authority point of view uh, to understand how you see things and how you're pushing things forward. Obviously, in Rasakema, you have a relatively ambitious target of growing tourism. So I want to understand how do you then uh, balance between the sustainability and that high growth in, in tourism and fast-paced development of the destination? Um, I think the question that you've asked is one that every tourism board is grappling with. I mean, we represent an industry which is the largest in the world. It accounts for one out of 10 jobs. It drives $1 out of 10. Uh, for us in Rasokema, tourism is about 5% of the GDP. And potentially we want to grow it to become a third of the GDP. So it is questions that we, we think of. And you used a very interesting word, balanced. We have a concept, a strategy called balanced tourism. As a nature emirate, we have this unique ecosystem of mountain, desert, and sea. We're naturally attuned to sustainability. But what that means is also, what are we looking at in terms of our pipeline? Is it thoughtful? Is it measured? Uh, one of the big announcements that have been coming up a couple of times is, is WIN coming to the destination, WIN Resort. Now, while they have impressive credentials as an integrated resort, when you look at them from a sustainability point of view, it's equally as impressive. 70% of the peak power that is uh, at WIN and Encore in Vegas is, is powered by renewable energies. They divert 25% to 100% of their waste from landfills. So we're also working with partners that have that in mind. So as a tourism board, you know, we, we definitely think about how do we reach our goal? Our goal is to reach 3 million visitors by 2030. How do we do it in a sustainable and responsible way? Knowing that we also need to work with our community. We just can't accelerate our growth, our visitor numbers and not bring the community on board. So we're looking at infrastructure, livabilities, schools, supply chains. So it's, it's an entire ecosystem. So I think it is a balance and it, it's something that we're navigating through, but I think it's something that every tourism authority is, is actually encountering. Thank you, Alka. And I think you mentioned a couple of interesting points about working with the private sector. And I want to uh, move on to, to uh, Yusuf uh, on that point. I want to understand, you know, how important is it to work with the private sector? And as a government authority, is it about uh, imposing mandatory uh, sustainability measures? Or is it about bringing everyone together and more on a voluntary basis? Or is it a mix, potentially, between the two? In general, we've been uh, grappling with the idea of sustainable tourism for a long time. Um, and uh, the question was, from a formulation perspective, was tough because we had tough targets to achieve by uh, uh, the, the beginning of this uh, decade. Uh, and with the expo coming in as well. So we started early enough, um, about eight, nine years ago, when we thought about our roadmap towards sustainable tourism. And we've uh, created and formulated a very clear plan about what do we want Dubai to look like going forward. There, at that point in time, even when we started that formulation exercise, we involved the private sector, the hoteliers, the operators, the tourism uh, companies, uh, the wider retail industry. We, we, we sat around the table. We came up with a plan that works for everyone. Um, so we had the uh, Supreme Council of Energy around the table. We had uh, people from DUA, from all of these guys. And, and we came up with a very clear uh, articulated plan. And we kind of uh, figured out our priorities. We didn't want to tackle everything at the same time. And uh, the, 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 the main part in terms of really the, the improving the destination was to enhance the hospitality uh, offering in itself. So uh, we focused our efforts in creating change, uh, phys uh, physically uh, visible and tangible change in the hospitality sector. So we've uh, established a, uh, a, a, a very clear sustainability transformation plan for that sector. 
we worked on enhancing, uh, even with that one, we focused initially on the initial quick changes that they could do, and that was focused around energy. And from energy management, we looked into the engagement with, uh, the, uh, f with, with the uh, tourists and guests in terms of the front uh, uh, end, the touch points inside the rooms, the, and what goes in, into laundry, into waste, into the whole thing. And once we, sh and, and we focused very much on the uh, development side, really ensuring that people do not think that sustainability is expensive, sustainability is rocket science. Every person, we wanted to make every person inside this industry think as a sustainable practitioner. So always think about the impact, the environmental impact, the uh, ecological impact, the sustainable impact of what they're doing inside the, the hotel. And we made sure that uh, we establish 19 standards of sustainability that would, uh, that, that would be the primer for hotels to implement and, and manage through it the, the, the uh, journey towards sustainability. And we figured out early enough that uh, we wanted to be sure that this is accepted. And the key thing to that is that s sustainability does not have to be considered expensive. Uh, rather, all of the initiatives that we've created have financial business cases. To themselves and that led to a wider acceptance and uh, it's it's been a journey and and we've seen it moving forward we've seen the needle moving and uh, from that perspective uh, we've seen the the results show up on our uh, and, and and when we measure uh, results we have uh, what's called the carbon calculator that measures uh, the, the actual uh, performance of the hotels on that front in collaboration with them. So uh, we couldn't have done all of this without really the hospitality sector coming together themselves and understanding the importance of how their operations impact the, the, the destinations they work in. And uh, we are happy to see that the resp responsible to tourism is, is gaining momentum, especially in line with uh, uh, the UAE hosting COP28 uh, this year. Uh, to show you how this extended beyond that recently, uh, we've launched under His Highness last year, uh, Sheikh Hamdan, the Dubai Can Initiative to replace uh, single-use plastic bottles. And I'm very happy to see that you guys are complying with the, uh, with the requirement there. And uh, you've been a very strong participant, uh, whether from the consulting or from the ATM or from the wider Dubai World Trade Center, who is a partner on this project. We've seen a huge reduction in, in waste generated. And we started with a proposition, the proposition being that plastic bottles are bad for you and, and, and it generates waste. With a small behavior change, you can actually save money whereby the uh, cost of the plastic bottle, 90% of it is the packaging. So uh, you could save yourself your money with putting a filter at home, putting a filter in the office, and, and carrying yourself a bottle. So it's, it's been a journey, and, and this, the uh, impact has been uh, impressive. Over 7 million uh, plastic bottles saved uh, just by the public fountains that we installed to change the behavior of people. Uh, the, the adoption in the private sector of a thousand corporations, we've got uh, a lot of hotels uh, Im implementing uh, bottling plants and uh, the momentum is going. And, and hopefully this year we're going to extend our program to involve uh, the academic sector and involve uh, other sectors as well to come on board. Uh, and, and hopefully it will drive further change and come up uh, and we hope to see more innovative ideas that to help this uh, to help uh, the, the the world basically we know at the dubai level we are uh, not moving the needle on a global scale but we hope that our business case is is, is one to be uh, used by other destinations as well so i think from what it sounds like is as a government you are there to support the private sector and even showcase and bring initiatives that maybe they would not think of or maybe they would think that are initiatives that require investment without any return. But you're saying that actually there are a lot of these investments that can be done that have a cost-saving impact as well and potentially a return on investment with the reduced operating expenses as well to these uh, type of initiatives, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. We've, we've done this on the retrofitting. 
uh, of uh, HVAC systems in hotels. So uh, one of the uh, first uh, uh, initiatives to reduce uh, the cost of uh, cooling um, and uh, with payback periods of uh, less than two years in some cases. So uh, that we have business cases in Dubai that have done this um, and we wanna, wanted to expand. And, and the good thing about that is that uh, with uh, the wider vision of Hazan Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, the UAE, uh, ruler of Dubai, we've seen uh, a push through the uh, Dubai government to focus on sustainability. And one of the things that have been done through DIWA is the establishment of a, a green fund. And one of those, uh, and uh, also with their support, we've seen uh, consultants in the industry uh, offering these project-based uh, uh, consultancies to hotels and also uh, general operators, where they calculate the payback period. Uh, the uh, Etihad Esco, the, you've seen uh, the Green Fund, where they offer a, uh, a trade-off in terms of an incentive for that conversion. Uh, and usually the payback period is quite good. Uh, we have business cases. If somebody is interested in, in looking into it, we're happy to guide them. The team downstairs can take their uh, contacts and, and help them out. Thank you. Hi, Tim. Obviously, you're from the operator side. You operate a lot of hotels in the region. You see what's happening on the ground, the, the challenges you know, that owners, investors are facing, and maybe questions that are being raised without answers, potentially. So I want to understand a bit you know, what, first of all, you as an operator do in terms of sustainability and what challenges you're hearing from owners that maybe could be overcome with the knowledge and, and the different solutions that are out there. Great. I think one thing I wanted to touch on is what Yusuf mentioned about sustainability should not be expensive. Um, it, is, it is at some point perceived as a cost rather than an investment. And IHG has launched a 10-year business plan called Journey to Tomorrow, which really focuses on people, community, and planning. But part of the work that we do in, in our hotels to operate sustainably is a tool that we installed called Green Engage. Green Engage is about 200 actions for general managers that allows them to reduce um, energy and energy costs. Uh, that has obviously a uh, ripple effect on reducing the carbon emission in these hotels, but also um, saving the bottom line. There's also another project that we launched recently, uh, which is called Winnow. Winnow is a, is a scale that takes mirror images of everything you throw in the bin, and then it gives you a weight of that item. So let's take oats, for example. If you end up at the end of the day throwing away about 80 liters of oats, you realize that you know, the chef needs to re-engineer their menu and take away the oats off of the buffet and then portion it on the menu so then you don't have that level of food waste in a certain item. But multiply that by, you know, a number of items that are on the buffet and A, your food cost is, is lower, but also you're saving um, uh, the planet by not throwing away all that food. Now, the interesting part is one of the hotels actually saved about $65,000 in one year in food waste using Winnow. Well, to, to me, that's not $65,000, that's 65,000 meals, because in, in some countries it is a dollar a meal, um, if you think about it, right? So the, uh, and also when you listen to experts, when you read about sustainability, when you attend conferences, when you read the news, you tend to think sustainability means something different to different people, right? Everyone has a different perspective on sustainability, and some may mix it with ecotourism or green tourism. Some may mix it with, yeah. I, I was involved in the UNWTO's um, sustainable development goals. So I was part of that steering committee in 2017. And sustainability comes across in 17 different goals that actually look at culture, uh, preserving uh, culture and heritage, um, uh, zero poverty, um, protecting life underwater, above water. Um, and, and this is where, you know, it's, it, it looks at where, you know, you asked the question before about sustainability. How do you, in a destination, continue to um, show a sustainable actions yet increasing your tourism numbers? Well, one of the best practices ever, if you've heard of an island called the island of Palau, you've got to Google this, island of Palau. So the island of Palau has about 50,000 people that live on this island, and they're all, they all come from a you know, fishing industry. 
the king of Palau was a fisherman amongst the fishermen. And they have about half a million tourists that come to this island every year. Now, in order for them to um, police tourists, because they can't police tourists, they introduced something called the Pledge of Palau. So before you go to the destination, when you go to get your visa, you have to pledge that you will not feed the wildlife, you will not litter, you will not use plastic, and so on and so forth. So that makes the tourists responsible. In the same way, taking that back into the hospitality industry, which unfortunately, as some of you may or may not know, hospitality is responsible to 10% of the world's carbon emission. And, and, and you think, well, why is that? Well, that's because consumers or guests, as we call them, stay in hotels, they take longer showers, um, keep the TV on when they leave, right? We keep the electricity on. We also tend to put the towels away for washing after every use. We require bed sheets to be changed every single day, but you don't do that at home. Uh, you probably use your towel a couple of times before you decide to wash it. You probably change your bed sheets every three, four days. It really depends on your preference. But, but when you come to a hotel, it becomes sort of, you know, I've paid for that room and I must consume. And that consumption translates into an unsustainable environment. Hence, you know, the hospitality is a, is a huge contributor. And, you know, with Green Engage, with IHG and a number of other initiatives, we are working on reducing that tremendously. But it really comes on, you spoke about ownership before, yeah? who owns? It's, it's us, it's humans, it's people who own this responsibility. We, we you know, we, there was a GBTA um, uh, report that came out recently, and it says, you know, nine out of 10 respondents actually say that they, uh, that uh, sustainability is very important to them. Yeah, Booking.com also says, you know, their respondents say they will book with, in, uh, with uh, um, industries or companies that have sustainable practices. But it's actually, well, they need to be clear sustainable practices because they need to be measured and they need to be reported. But until today, I think measures and reports are still a bit vague. We don't have a clear way to measure sustainability and consumption, whether you're a company or a hotel or an airline, right? There's, there's not really a clear way to do that. And, and until unless the industry is ready to report on these measures, then we'll be able to take clear actions to reduce carbon footprint and work towards a carbon emission, a zero carbon emission in the future. Now, one of the initiatives we're doing is we are actually developing what we call the Hotel of the Future, which is a blueprint with very clear criteria of what a carbon zero hotel looks like, you know, from the design into the build, into the operation, way from the outset. That's a huge exercise because then it goes back to cost, as Yusuf was alluding to, right? Investors today look at design, build, and operate a sustainable hotel as an expense. Because look, technically, because we don't have the reporting mechanisms today, we're not able to give you a clear return on investment. But the one clear return on investment is if you have a zero emission hotel, right, it should increase the value of your asset. So should you decide to sell your asset in years to come, you already have a hotel that's, that's already uh, uh, at net zero. Now, there's, there's two costs. There's two, you know, the legacy hotels that were built in the 60s and the 70s, you know, converting those into a, um, a free or carbon emission uh, uh, hotels. Um, that's gonna be a, quite expensive to do that, right? But then design and build from the outset may not be as expensive as converting. So it's, it's a strategy that has to work both ways, converting the existing assets, but also building for the future. Because if you're just continuing to build and your existing is sitting at you know, very high carbon emission consumption and, and unsustainable practices, you will not end up, you'll end up with new hotels you know, that are working towards sustainability and existing ones are not, and, and vice versa. But I can tell you today with IHG, you know, we, we are working closely with designers and consumers and, 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 and also investors in order to identify what sustainability looks like, you know, whether you take shorter showers, uh, whether we then, I mean, we're working with um, uh, a company today to be able to identify the amount of water you use and the amount of electricity you use per room. So imagine this, you, you go to check out, you get your room bill, and on the bottom it says you, Hytham, have consumed 
600 liters of water and you've consumed 1,000 kilowatts of electricity. What have you been doing? Uh, relax. So, so this is not to necessarily start charging people for the kilowatts or liters of water they consume, but actually A, to educate. Oh, wow, I didn't know I consumed that much in my room, oh, right? But then incentivize you for the future. So listen, the next time you reduce your consumption, we're gonna give you points. Points you can burn into the food and beverage, you can earn and, you know, and burn in the restaurants and the bars, and that incentivizes people to start being responsible, because unless we all become responsible to take our part in reducing uh, our carbon emission, um, it, it's not gonna be just the responsibility of a hotel company or an airline or a government authority. Now again, going back to what Yusuf said also on the regulation, right? He mentioned we've got standards, clear sustainability standards. What we need is the regulator in the same way. So a government entity needs to be the regulator that finds hotels and operators and, and, and companies and industries for not complying with sustainability standards. So the more you get fined and, and you know, the more you start to comply, the more we're gonna get adaptability and adoptability across you know, the, 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 the world with sustainable practices. All right, thank you, Haitham. And uh, you know, as, you, as you talked about, when you start from scratch, the hotel of the future becomes much more easy than taking a hotel from the 60s or 70s, trying to retrofit everything. So I think that brings me to Sardan. Obviously, you're developing a completely new destination up in the mountains in Saudi Arabia. That, that's a very interesting and, point. And you know, can you develop three-star hotels, four-star hotels that are sustainable at an affordable cost, targeting more affordable tourists? Or does this have to be at the five-star luxury level because you know, those are the tourists that are willing to pay extra. Or does it not have to cost more or that much more to develop a sustainable hotel? In all honesty, it's not going much deeper into the um, operating model of, of our destination. What we looked at when it comes to sustainability is the carrying capacity of what we have there. Carrying capacity of the environment and the carrying capacity of the broader surroundings. Because for us, the main idea is to, when we speak about sustainability, to preserve the business case of our destination. And the two main elements of the business case of our destination are nature and culture. If we lose nature, we will lose culture. If we lose culture and nature, we will lose the destination. There was, there's nothing that we are going to be able to sell in the future. So for us, this, the, this equation is super simple. We are protecting and investing into rebuilding and conserving and activating the heritage. And we are doing ecosystem restoration not only because we are a responsible company that we are, but also because we want to emphasize the business case that we have and we want to be able to utilize this model in the years to come. I wish in perpetuity, of course, but let's, let's not be as ambitious and say in the years to come. To do that, you have to look at the carrying capacity. How many tourists can your area receive per year or per season in a number of different facilities, in a number of different mixes of uses that your assets or mix mixes of assets that your destination will have. So we started our master planning that we are now finalizing, looking at the carrying capacity. How many tourists can come and visit? And what, for example, when it, when it comes to the obvious issues like energy uh, or environmental media like water, etc. You know, how can we make sure that we don't overconsume. How can we make sure that we don't overspend? And if you look at that as the first step in your um, economic or operational model development, then it is, I won't say relatively easy, but relatively easier to look at your mixes, look at your assets, look at the star rating of your assets, look at the infrastructure that will serve these assets in the future. And at the end of the day, look at the longevity of the, of the destination, because everything that we build has a certain life cycle. And what we wanted to, to, to make sure is that, of course, start on the right foot and start looking at, as I said, the, 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 a little bit of a broader picture. This also involves the local communities and how we deal with local communities, that we don't want to be a, space, a shiny spaceship on top of a mountain. We want to integrate them. Again, because we are responsible and we, of course, follow ESG principles, but we also are very keen on having, you know, the business case of our destination functioning in, in, in the future. Okay, thank you. 
<clears throat> Alka, I want to come over to you. Um, I think Haitha mentioned something very interesting that we've seen the surveys from Boogie.com, from different uh, authorities out there that identify that people want to stay somewhere sustainable and they want to uh, be sustainable in their actions. But I think there is a lack of understanding of you know, which hotel is more sustainable than the other, for example, or which destination is abiding by certain sustainability measures. And then you have a lot of complicated jargon that a normal tourist might not be able to understand. So how would you be able to bridge that, you know, the actual efforts being done and sustainability measures being done to the understanding of uh, a normal tourist? I think that's a really good question because you talked about the jargon and you can fall into this bucket of greenwashing just based on saying that I've recycled, I have, I've eliminated single-use plastic. I mean, it encompasses a lot more than that. So we've been working with EarthCheck and they're a leader in sustainable tourism, similar to Green Keys and SGS. And we've been working with them for two years and we launched Responsible Rack. And what we wanted to do is, we've got some fantastic brands, global brands that have credentials when it comes to this uh, type of industry. I've been working for FRHI, Fairmont, and Fairmont essentially wrote the book on green operations 20 years ago. So all the great works from, from the brands that we have, from Accor, Marriott, Hilton, we want to scale it up to a destination level. And how do we do that? So working with EarthCheck and launching Responsible Rack, we introduced a dashboard knowing that we needed clean data. We can't go anywhere unless we know what the consumption is. Um, so we have 10 performance metrics and our hotels every quarter, every month will input what they do from energy consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, potable water consumption, and even looking at things like social implications. Do you have amortization in your hotels? Is there gender parity? So we measured all that. So the year 2022, we gathered all the data from about 20 uh, tourism businesses. This is attractions and hotels. Now we know what we're working with. And with that in mind, we're able to put plans in place saying, you know, this hotel might be a bit further along than this other one. So how do we, how do we ramp up? So as a tourism board, we're able to monitor that. We're also able to incentivize. If we know that hotels are reaching green benchmarks in certain areas, we can incentivize that. And again, it comes to how do you relate this to the end user, the consumer? And we've introduced certification. So we, we have Responsible Rack, but we also work with WTTC. They have a basics program and they work with Green Keys and SGS, which adds an extra layer of credibility and scrutiny to what we're trying to do. And they measure hotel performance as well. And I think with these ratings, uh, with, with certification, that guests can really feel comfortable when they're coming to the hotels that they are having a sustainable experience. But it's not only hotels. You can look at things like events. Uh, this year alone at Arab Aviation Summit, uh, it was the first time that it was a carbon neutral tourism and aviation event. We were able to look at every participant coming in, we calculated you know, how much carbon they use from flights, transportation, hotels, and we gave them the opportunity to offset that through a carbon emission scheme or through SAFs. So there's different ways to communicate to guests, to conference goers, to event goers, what you can do to make your stay more manageable from a sustainable uh, perspective. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> back to Haitham on, on the point of the tourists, you know, whether they care or not about sustainability in hotels. Um, you know, is there a difference you're seeing in your hotels between, let's say, the individual tourist that might not really understand what hotels are doing versus the larger corporate buyers? Do they care about sustainability? Because we know a lot of corporations have very strict sustainability goals and ambitions, does that translate into the bookings into your hotels as well, or, or you, you're not seeing No, like I said before, obviously, it, you know, corporations today do want to associate themselves with companies that have clear sustainable practices. So yes, when it comes to um, uh, companies for booking groups uh, with us, they do seek you know, sustainable practices in our hotels. Um, and you asked earlier about tourists, do they care? 
I, I think, look, when you say I want to travel somewhere sustainably, there's an oxymoron there when you get on a flight, right? You, you get on a plane because you want to travel sustainably, but your carbon footprint is already as huge as this show. So there is an oxymoron there, right? Yes, we care, but also we want to get there. There's a human nature of I want to get there, I want to enjoy myself. So we're kind of selective on what part of sustainability role we want to play. And so, we, and, and hence, you know, we could look at tourists or travelers or guests in a way when they arrive at a hotel and their expectations from a hotel and, and you'll find individuals who care a lot about food and food waste and that they're very passionate about it, right? Yet they might overlook many other steps during their touch points or during their journey touch points, right? In staying in a hotel. But that, because they're very passionate about that, right? They, they really care about food waste. And they, they want to understand what our hotel's doing with that food. And you'll get people asking you questions. What are you doing with that food? You'll, you'll get people who are really passionate about energy consumption. And you'll see them going around switching lights in the rooms and what have you, but, and turning off TVs, and that's what they care about. So there isn't really one size that fits all when it comes to sustainable practices and what tourists actually care for. But there is a trend, let's say, where corporations want to sign up with companies that show clear sustainable practices and goals. Um, sustainability is very um, important for us in IG, hence it is part of our annual reporting uh, um, that we do, but also individuals who, as I said, have in you know, a selective sustainable uh, practice care for, um, seek for these uh, um, experiences when they go to the hotel or these practices when they go to a certain hotel, and hence they make their selections uh, of, of their stay based on that. Okay, thank you. Last question for uh, Yusuf. You mentioned about the green fund or green financing. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how that plays a role in, in this ecosystem and what kind of initiatives those kind of funds are for? I, I think in general giving a uh, kickstart to any of these initiatives is a good thing, whether it comes from a, a, a central source or from the industry itself. Um, the, the key thing that uh, how, how uh, we work, the retrofitting plan was uh, we made the savings pay back the principal loan for the project financing. So uh, the delta between the uh, pre-retrofit uh, and uh, post-retrofit uh, will, uh, will, will basically pay, uh, pay the uh, installments. So uh, until that gets covered and then so, so the hotel operator will end up still paying that higher tariff uh, until the settlement is done. And, and uh, funny enough, a lot of these hotels, when they look at the business uh, case, they find out that, you know what, we want our ROI to increase, we're not gonna, uh, we're gonna fund this ourselves. So, so it, it, te it tends to give them a serious look at it. So uh, we, we've initiated this uh, about two years ago. Um, and uh, as uh, you were saying, Old hotels, you know, you can't teach dogs new tricks. So, so there is a limitation to how much an old asset could, uh, you know, be improved. So uh, ha having new hotels adapt uh, sustainable, uh, you know, design and construction methods and, and, and uh, systems is the way forward uh, for, for it to uh, achieve a, a more uh, impactful. And uh, we've recently uh, launched uh, the uh, the enforcement of our sustainability standards and the regulation is uh, enforced in Dubai so uh, hotels have to uh, comply with our standards and uh, as we move forward we will be looking at how do we move the targets further uh, you know and make it harder and, and make it more uh, ambitious so so uh, yeah I, th I think it it, it, it requires for, for uh, as you said, you, you need to kind of put the incentives for uh, the, the guests to uh, have an incentive in it to, to become more sustainable, where they get either loyalty points 
or they get a cheaper point. But I do believe that uh, cost-wise, it, it, with the hotels participating in, in a more active manner, we're going to see uh, a kind of a more profitable industry for the hotel sector and also a profitable and, and, and a more cost-effective uh, travel experiences without harming the experience itself. Thank you. So our session is coming to an end, but I think in conclusion from what we gather, you know, very basically from, you know, 45 minutes of, of talks, it sounds like obviously everyone has a role to play. Not everyone has to pay in the same way, I think, as Sardan was saying in the beginning as well. I think the developer obviously has a major role in terms of paying financially for any investment because they are the ones developing the assets that you know, need to be up to the standards of the sustainability measures. But then obviously the government has a very important role to play on pushing and motivating and providing those incentives and initiatives and ideas to the private sector and developers to be able to guide them into the right direction and for everyone to move in the, in the same direction as well, not you know, one going this way and <laughs> one going that way. And then obviously the operator, which has a very, very important role to play as well in terms of, you know, how do you manage these properties from a sustainable point of view? And again, from supporting with initiatives uh, that are learned globally from different uh, countries in terms of initiatives of um, the, the hotel of the future and, and the likes. So I think at the end of the day, everyone has a responsibility, but I think different parties are paying in, in different ways. So I'd like to thank everyone. Uh, Haitham, Yusuf, Alka, and Sardan, thank you very much. Thank you.